And the 2024 Nobel Prize in Physics goes to... Wait, it goes to artificial intelligence? Isn't that computer science? That's not physics. Well, actually, it is. Hey, Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Liu, and this year's Nobel Physics Prize went to John Hopfield and Jeffrey Hinton for their foundational discoveries and inventions that enable machine learning with artificial neural networks. But what does that even mean, and what does it even have to do with physics? Well, as a physicist myself who works on the interface with machine learning, I would say that I'm in a pretty good position to answer that. So let's begin. But first of all, let's start with what exactly a neural network is. So in machine learning, basically, you're trying to find relationships and patterns in data to map from one domain into another. So your input domain might be information about, say, a house, which includes things like the number of bedrooms it has, the area it covers, the number of good schools in the catchment area. Whereas the output domain would be, for example, the price of the house. This is something that you're interested in. The domains could be literally anything, but let's say this number is the input, and we want to learn how to map this number to this output number. Now, the machine learning is a black box, but if I told you that to get from the input to the output, all you have to do is multiply by some weight W and add some bias B, you'll be thinking, well, there's so many things that W and B could be. There's so many combinations. But if I gave you more pairs of inputs and outputs, these are more data samples, it would be easy to see that W here would be three and B would be two. So there you have it, you've just made your first neural network, the simplest machine learning or AI model. This network is just one input node or neuron connected to an output node, where the weights are like the connections between them. But just like neurons in the human brain, in principle, you could have many nodes with many connections each have their own weights and biases. The more nodes that you have, the more complex relationships and patterns that you can create. But in order for this to work mathematically, you also need activation functions, which are nonlinear functions applied on the operation after applying weights and biases. Because otherwise, you could just simplify your network from many nodes to just a single one. It would give you the same result. Likewise, this activation function is similar to neurons in our brains. Neurons in the brain only fire when they have enough electrical potential. And in a neural network, the amount of information is only communicated over if you meet a certain criteria, if you meet a threshold. A common activation function is called the ReLU activation function. It outputs values only if the input is positive, otherwise it will output zero. So there you have it, artificial neural networks are based on how electrical signals propagate along neurons in the brain, which is biophysics, so physics applied to biology, so it's just physics. But actually, the physics connection doesn't end there. John Hopfield's work, which earned him the Nobel Prize in Physics, explicitly used ideas from spin glass systems in physics to develop a type of neural network known as Hopfield networks. So in physics, a spin glass is a type of material where the magnetic moments or spins of the atoms and particles interact in a very complex, irregular way. Unlike typical ferromagnetic materials, where spins align in a regular pattern, in spin glasses, the interactions between spins are often completely random. Sometimes they align, other times they don't. And this leads to many possible stable configurations that we call local energy minima. Hopfield used spin glass theory to explain brain function and neural networks. You see, like the configurations of spins in a spin glass, the brain and neural networks can have billions of neurons and connections, which will also have conflicting signals and constraints. The brain can be thought of having an energy landscape where different stable configurations correspond to different patterns of neural activity. 
Each minimum in this energy landscape can represent a memory or uh, data outputs you've already seen. So in Hot Fields Network, whilst trying to optimize the weights to best match the data, the network essentially creates this energy landscape of hills and valleys. That's the mapping. Now let's say our input is a ball dropped at a certain point in the energy landscape. It will eventually roll all the way to the local minima. And this is the output. This is the stable configuration. When you have another input similar to the first, it will similarly roll towards the nearest local energy minima based on the stored memory. So the memories essentially live in these valleys, in these local minima pots. Hotfields Networks introduced the energy function inspired by Hamiltonians in physics and used in spin glass theory. And this is what steers the network towards the energy minima that corresponds to the stored memories. It also demonstrated associative memory, meaning it can retrieve a complete stored memory even when presented with a partial or noisy version. This is because the network's dynamics naturally roll downhill in the energy landscape towards the minimum. This represents the closest stored memory. But memorizing an image is easy. And besides, the Hotfield networks had some limitations. They had limited storage capacity. The number of patterns that could be reliably stored in a Hotfield network was proportional to about 0.15 times the number of neurons. So you'd need a lot of neurons to make a lot of memories, which limits the scalability of the model. And also they were prone to getting stuck in spurious minima, so the wrong memories. And they were deterministic, meaning you always end up in the same stable state if you feed it the same input. Jeffrey Hinton, our second Nobel physics laureate, took the Hopfield network and then developed it into Boltzmann machines. So Boltzmann's machines are a probabilistic generalization of Hopfield networks. So running the same inputs can give you different minima and hence outputs. It draws its name and inspiration from the Boltzmann distribution in statistical physics. In statistical physics, the Boltzmann distribution describes the probability of a system, like a collection of atoms or molecules, being in a particular state based on its energy. Lower energy states are more probable. Similarly, in a Boltzmann machine, the network state is defined by the configuration of its neurons. They're either on or off. The Boltzmann distribution is used to define a probability distribution over all possible states of the network. Instead of always going downhill towards the nearest local minima, Boltzmann machines can sometimes jump to higher energy states. Now, this helps them escape from local minima and potentially find a better lower energy solution, a better representation of the data. They also use simulated annealing, which is a technique inspired by the cooling of materials in physics. Boltzmann machines can gradually reduce their temperature, a parameter which would control the probability of jumping to higher energy states. So initially, the temperature is very high, which means you have a lot of energy, so you can explore around the energy landscape quite uh, quickly and widely. And then gradually, when you lower this temperature, you'll slowly settle down into a low energy state, into a minima avoiding you getting trapped into suboptimal solutions. By introducing this stochasticity, Hinton extended the deterministic Hopfield network into a more flexible and more powerful model. So instead of memorizing specific examples, the Boltzmann machine can make inferences even on things that it had never seen before, using only examples that it had seen. Both Hotfield Networks and Boltzmann Machines were huge influences to AI that we use today. But at the end of the day, it's all just physics. Anyway, that's all I have time for this week. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe. Soaring past my